Hello, I will now uh, continue with the second part of this uh, lecture in which I will uh, build on what uh, I've uh, presented earlier, the Lattice Boltzmann basic uh, model, which uh, here I remind you is like a linearized Boltzmann equation described, discretized on a lattice both in space and time and which is characterized by a finite set of velocities. And from the evolution of these, var I mean, of the densities uh, or the, the probabilities of, of having species at a given node moving in any direction, one can, through moments, extract the hydrodynamic variables. So, as I finished in the previous section, one can recover the hydrodynamic expected behavior from from a, a liquid because here we conserve mass, momentum, and then the lattice and the subset of velocity chosen to ensure that isotropy is recovered in that regime. And now what I want to discuss is how one can build on this. This, this uh, model constitutes the basic uh, system, the basic model system that evolves in, in time and space. And I want to consider now how we can, um, for example, force it by, I mean, one could force it by an external force or by putting walls or by including particles. So I will be describing how to uh, make this uh, liquid or this distribution function that gives rise to this liquid behavior interact, for example, with a solid particle, with a solid object. This could be, say, a particle, could be also a wall, can be a porous medium, can be any object, any uh, interface at the end that is interacting with, with this uh, lattice where we have the distribution function defined with. Um, so let, let's consider just uh, uh, that, imagine I would like to consider a spherical particle that is suspended in this uh, medium. And then I could, could ask the question how this particle will, will move or will be uh, driven by, by the flow. And the way, I mean, there are different ways to, to uh, couple them, uh, one of the natural ways to do it is to consider that because we have a lattice, everything lives on a lattice, if I have here fluid nodes on a lattice uh, and I know where I have a sphere, where the center of the sphere is, for example, in this case, in this node, then if I have here a, a radius, the radius would be 2.5 lattice spacings in this case, then that defines a, a, a surface. And some for some nodes, there will be speeds that will move from outside to inside the, uh, the, the, the sphere. So, I mean, I'm not drawing here all velocities because it would be uh, overwhelming, but you can imagine that uh, this node here will have, say, if it could be a D3Q15, there would be 15 velocities, or if this is 2D, imagine this is, we, we have say eight velocities out of the eight, then three good cross. I mean, in the advection step where I have to move the density in the node, the density that could be pointing here left could enter the particle, and, and that's not allowed. If we have a, a, a solid object, fluid cannot, or the I mean, the, the fluid particles that are represented by, by this F cannot penetrate into the solid. So one needs to introduce a boundary condition that prevents that. And, and therefore, if I do that with all the corresponding uh, links here, I've listed them. So let's say from a practical point of view, if I, if I have a particle, knowing the particle center and the radius, I can then uh, look it through the lattice and identify which are these uh, links that cross the, the surface, and then I can replace the standard updating rule that I was explaining you for lattice Boltzmann by another rule, uh, that that rule will implement the boundary condition. The nice thing of this is that the this is purely local, and therefore we keep the locality, as I said, from the lattice Boltzmann uh, algorithm, and, and therefore one can think of a sphere, a disk, uh, but one could also think in objects of any size. Or for example, instead of a sphere, I could consider, imagine I could consider a liquid between walls. Then in that case, I could have a wall, say, for example, parallel to this axis over the whole system size. 
and, and therefore I could implement a boundary condition with the wall exactly in the same way that I do it for a particle. So from a, an algorithmic point of view, I need to identify this list of links in specify a rule that does not allow the density to go in. And that's true for any geometry. I don't need to adapt the code. And that is also an advantage of, of this of the method that that allows to formulate everything in a local local. So um, what rule can we impose? Again, depending on what you want to look or what is the interaction, what how the fluid interacts with the solid, one can think of different rules. The standard one is to, uh, because that's something we know from, uh, from fluid mechanics, for example, that if we have an, a solid object, typically the liquid tends to get to this, to, to have the same velocity as the particle, these are stick boundary conditions. And actually one way to implement that is by imposing what is called a bounce back. So essentially what, what it says, the rule is that if we have a particle coming in, the density that would come in then is reflected back. So it will, if it's moving to the right initially, then afterwards it will be moving to the left, okay? That's the basic rule and uh, which again, it uh, can be easily implemented. If instead we have now an, a particle that is moving, has a certain velocity or a wall that has a velocity, one, has, one should implement this bounce back in the frame of reference of the particle motion. As I said, if we want to have, um, okay, I went too fast. This bounce back uh, strictly uh, imposed as such will, will mean that the velocity during half part of the of the time step is going to the right then over part of the step will be going to the left so on average somewhere uh, in between these two nodes that connect this link the velocity will be zero so this is effectively one can prove that that this rule leads to a zero velocity uh, within the discretization in the position that we have for, for the discretization of the lattice so if we have an object that moves with a velocity sorry that's what i was saying before now we should impose this bounce back not in the frame of reference of the lab but in the frame of reference of the moving object and again one can formulate it and um, write this down and actually i mean here uh, this n here is stands for the f in in previous transparency sorry so what what it says is that the the f that goes into minus i is the so meaning opposite so in the direction opposite to the to the um, crossing link, uh, then uh, it's simply reflected. And then if there is a velocity, then one has to subtract a certain amount. I mean, one can prove that this is the right transformation. I don't do that here, but you, you can find it. So the, this is then a local rule in which if I know the, velo the local velocity of the, of, that, of, of the solid particle at that link that is crossing from liquid to solid, then I can implement a boundary condition that will uh, make the liquid to get the fluid, uh, sorry, the solid velocity. So that's a stick boundary condition. If the uh, particle has a, I mean, in the case of, an, of a wall, for example, that's the velocity of the wall, so it's the same velocity. In the case of a, of a colloid or a particle suspended in liquid, a particle, this particle can have a translation velocity, but also a rotational velocity. And if it rotates, then the velocity at different nodes will be differently, where we'll have a different value, but one can compute that. If we know the velocity, the linear and angular velocity of the object, one can know what is the local velocity at each of these links and then impose this stick boundary condition uh, node by node. And that will then lead to the fluid to get the corresponding linear and rotational velocity of the object. When doing that, when, when, when we implement this rule, uh, this means that during one time step, a distribution function that was moving to the left, for example, in that example, will move moving to the, to the right. So in that link, momentum is not conserved because the change in density, we, we don't change the density, I mean, the mass is conserved, but momentum is inverted. So this means that the liquid has this change in momentum, but momentum globally is conserved, which means that this change in, in momentum is a force that this rule is exerting on the color and the particle that is suspended. So if I sum all these changes in momentum, 
which is what I express here. So if I call this momentum of force exchange per link, uh, in terms as, as I apply this rule with respect to the velocity of the link, that is the force on the link. If I sum over all these links, then that will give me the total force. And if I look, if I do this, the um, cross product with respect to the vector that joins the center of mass of the particle to this, uh, to this node, the node, uh, the middle of the link that joins this, this fluid and liquid, uh, fluid and solid nodes, then that will give me the total torque. So I can then compute the total force and total torque that this rule will create on this suspended particle. And then I can now have uh, couple this rule for the fluid that will tell me how the lattice Boltzmann will evolve to the next step and how this boundary condition will impose the flow, the, the, the emergence of the corresponding flow in the medium. From the point of view of the object, if I know what is the total force and torque, I can have a kind of a molecular dynamics for the coverage. I can say, well, now, if I know the force in, due to this exchange, and then if I have more than one particles, if they interact through a Hamiltonian, I can compute, uh, sorry, this is the, the interaction with the colloid, and then with the other particles, I can look at the pairwise interactions. That gives me, essentially, I can write down a equation of motion similar to what you would do in, in for, for a standard Newton's equation of motion. The other thing is that there is this extra force that we exchange with the, with the fluid, and then I can advance particle position. So that gives me a possibility to move the particle. The particle can move, the center of mass of the particle can move continuously in space at each time step. If I know where the center of mass is, I know then I can identify the links that go from fluid to a solid, and then I keep on applying the rule at each time step. There is a certain amount of bookkeeping to identify this, this list of links because it's changing, but uh, what this can be, done, can be done routinely. And then that will allow us to have now a hybrid algorithm where the fluid evolves with lattice Boltzmann with these specific bounce back boundary conditions. And then from there, I can identify the corresponding evolution which is a molecular dynamics type evolution for, for the colloids uh, with the corresponding momentum exchange between particle and solid done consistently. So that now global momentum is conserved, the momentum of the fluid plus the momentum of the colloid. So the suspended particles is conserved because is conserved because there is no applied external force. Okay, so that's uh, the way now to move from liquid now to a suspension. And also if I have, for example, walls that confine the system, I would do the same. And then I can sort of like, for example, if I have a wall with a moving velocity, I can drive the fluid by a moving wall. And that, for example, would lead eventually to a quiet flow. So that's, and, and everything is local. As I said, it's the same regardless of the, um, of, of the geometry of the suspended particle. I, I wanted now to, uh, to try to understand, I mean, to, to analyze how we can look at the dynamics of these suspensions and uh, certain aspects that one needs to be careful to when modeling this type of system. So this is now more advancing into the exploitation of this type of algorithms because if, if one thinks in, in this type of suspended particles, and, and this is now more a and maybe in some of the other methods uh, that you have been exposed to in previous weeks, you have gone through similar uh, discussions. Uh, as I said, in lattice Boltzmann, the linear lattice Boltzmann that we use routinely, there is uh, the flexibility to choose the time scales in the collision matrix um, so that we can tune the transport properties decoupled from any microscopic origin. That is very powerful because that allows us to control uh, the, with a lot of flexibility, the dynamical regime and the properties of, of, the, of the system. But one has to be careful to that the choice is, is done consistently. And when we start now, for example, mixing the, this fluid with particles, there is a choice, a set of uh, choices that one needs to make and those have to be done within certain bounds. So it is important with these mesoscopic methods, I mean, these are kinetic methods, but the same how would happen with uh, 
with the particle collision dynamics or with DPD, uh, there is uh, one needs to, to understand what's the objective or which type of systems one, one is interested in simulating to make a choice that is consistent. So in the case of, of suspensions, there is what one has to think about uh, what are the, the, the behavior of these objects inside the, the fluid the liquid, I'm now thinking in, in a suspensions of particles that are, mm, say, small, micron size, nanos of, of a nanoscopic size. So they can get to equilibrium in a suspension uh, because of thermal fluctuations. If one thinks in or analyzes what, what is the dynamics of this coupled system, as I said, one can solve lattice Boltzmann and, and the molecular dynamics consistently, but, but now one has to ensure that this is done also coherently. Actually, if one looks into what happens to the system, there are a number of time scales that are ordered. I mean, that they have a certain hierarchy. I mean, at, at very, very small time scales, if, if, if we resolve the collisions of the solvent, there is on 10 to the minus 15 seconds is typically the solvent collision time. So these are associated to the atomic resolution or atomic structure of the solvent. Uh, then, as a, as, a, as, a, as a result of these collisions, then the fluid decorrelates, and and there is then a time scale in which you start having a sort of like a collective behavior of the of the um, uh, solvent, and as the result, result of, of that, I was saying at some point there is a hydrodynamic modes that that develop collective modes. Uh, that, that's what I was referring in this Chamonensko limit. In, in that regime, first, one typically has the sound modes that are the, the, the propagation of sound, which if I look at the time scale, it takes for a sound to move over, say, a micron-sized particle. Uh, this is typically 10 to the minus 10 seconds. And then uh, later we have on the time scale of, of 10 to the minus six seconds, the time scale in which the inertia of the particle is lost. If you, you, uh, and then also the time scale in which momentum diffuses over particle size. And it's only at much lower, uh, larger time scales, so it's a slower process, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus one is when the seconds is the time it takes a colloid to diffuse its own size. So you can see that there is really a large, I mean, orders of magnitude difference in all these temporal processes. When, when we simulate or consider the solvent in terms of this distribution function as, as for the uh, um, lattice Boltzmann, uh, a number of these effects that are associated to the atomic structure of the solvent are not recovered. And, and actually this type of approach works because these, these are so short that if we are interested in what happens on much long, longer time scales, that is not so relevant that's uh, ne needed to generate these collective modes, but we introduce the collective behavior through the kinetic model. Uh, it, but then still from the sound till the particle motion, there are typically uh, 10 orders of magnitude. So there is no way you can do that on, on a reasonable simulation. So actually what Lattice Boltzmann does and also what many of these other mesoscopic models does is that they reduce this uh, widespread number of, of decades and make them to, to be much closer to each other. So, uh, so by, by choosing, I mean, uh, a, a sound that proportionally is not much larger sound, speed of sound than, for example, the time in which uh, the viscosity that is associated to momentum diffusion, we, one can sort of like cover those scales more easily. Okay, so that's something that is intrinsic to all these models, which means then that it's difficult really to do, I mean, if you want to do a realistic simulation time scales, all these methods will fail one way or the other, but still what is important is that at least you keep the hierarchy so that you ensure that the propagation of sound is faster than the diffusion uh, of momentum and is, that is faster than the diffusion of the particle, okay, that these processes are kept uh, uh, structured. So that, that poses limits in how 
you can choose the viscosity of your system or the parameters that you put into the lattice Boltzmann uh, depending on, on what processes you want to, to look at. The, the same applies to the Reynolds number, for example. The, these particles, because they are very small, typically they, they move uh, at very low Reynolds number. And ideally, one could try to think in getting the zero Reynolds number, but that is hard to do numerically. Actually, what, what um, Reynolds number tells us is that when inertia is relevant compared to momentum diffusion, and for example, these are just, I mean, again, one has to always check for each problem, but uh, practice shows that th this is a prototypical example with lattice Boltzmann of a particle that is sedimenting. In this case, we know what is the solution of the velocity field for a zero Reynolds number. And basically, one can sort of compute the difference between the magnitude of the velocity from simulation and the zero Reynolds number uh, prediction. And basically, you can see that for values that are, I mean, obviously, if Reynolds number is 0.8 or 0.08, you can't see differences, but already 0.08, they are not very large. And when you go to 0.008, they are minute, which again means that even if in reality, the, the, the actual Reynolds number can be 10 to the minus 7 or 10 to the minus 8, by ensuring that this is small enough compared to 1, that allows us to recover realistic uh, uh, results. This is just a, a, a warning in the sense that you always need to, for all these mesoscopic models, you always need to assess where you are uh, so that then you ensure that you choose parameters in a, in a consistent way. Okay. I mean, this is just a table where I, again, here I was talking about, I mean, the, there is no absolute time scale. I was saying, well, what is the time in which it takes the sound propagate over particle size or momentum to diffuse. Obviously, it's not the same if I take a micron sized particle or a 0.1 or a 10 nanometer. So the time scales vary because they, I mean, this is how they scale. So they scale differently with particle size. But still, even if the, the hierarchy that I told you is relatively generic. Now, I wanted to show you in the last part of this uh, lecture how one can, I mean, how much we, one can extract from this lattice Boltzmann to understand uh, fundamental properties of the dynamics of suspensions. And, and I will do that with a classical problem, uh, which is the analysis of what, how does a particle move in, in, a, in, a, in a solvent. So this is, in principle, very simple. You all know that if we have a particle that can be thermalized, uh, then uh, it will execute a random walk, a uh, random motion in, inside the solvent and the detail of the dynamics of this particle, uh, the, the first uh, approach to, to understand the fundamentals of how this equilibrium is rich, uh, were, were uh, posed or explained by Langevin uh, at the beginning of last century uh, in, in terms of what we know as the Langevin equation. So the acceleration of the particle, if it's isolated, the absence of any other interaction is a combination of a friction force when particle tends to move against the liquid and then a random force. And then the random force is a Gaussian noise. And then the second moment is coupled to gamma, to the friction and to the temperature so that then fluctuation dissipation uh, is preserved. And actually this is reasonable and it was uh, uh, understood as the basic dynamics of, of for these suspensions. But if you look into details about what implications it has, the, for example, you can compute the velocity autocorrelation function for this particle and then and, and it decays exponentially with uh, a, a characteristic time that is essentially the friction divided by the mass that you put here. Don't you have to so, so basically the decay is exponential. Um, and, and it was quite a surprise when in the late 60s with molecular dynamic simulations, Alder and Wainwright uh, discovered that autocorrelation function of a particle was decaying algebraically. So in three dimensions, the autocorrelation uh, function of velocity was decaying as t to the minus three halves. And actually that led to uh, a, a lot of work in kinetic theory because previously kinetic theory, also starting from the Boltzmann equation with the standard assumptions had shown this exponential decay 
also from from Langevin. So everything was sim, sim consistent. But actually, what happens is that behavior is a bit more subtle because again, due to the fact that momentum is conserved when the particle starts moving, it generates flow around it. The liquid is not a passive medium that simply exerts a friction, which is the assumption of, of Langevin. Uh, it's actually the particle moves, and then as it moves, it generates it, it generates transport. Part of the momentum that is is transfer from the particle to the fluid sort of propagates in the fluid because it has to be globally conserved. It cannot disappear. And actually, if, if you look in detail into that, then this 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 conserve this con the conservation law leads necessarily to this algebraic decay. So it's it's a feature of, of this of this uh, uh, essential um, symmetry of the system. So that actually uh, afterwards, obviously, more more detailed analysis from kinetic theory showed that indeed there are correlated uh, collisions. So it's in a way, if you want, I, I, this is this comes from a lattice gas automaton. Actually, if you have a particle and give a velocity at, at a given time later. What happens is that the, the particle is initially moving to the right. Afterwards, with time, because of noise, we'll start moving in other directions. But because of this initial motion at the given time is moving to the right, it generates a flow that tends to develop into vortices because momentum is conserved. And these vortices have the symmetry uh, imposed by the initial motion. So this leads to a counterflow. So in a way, the, if you want, the liquid kicks back in the, in the particle with respect to its initial direction and then forces or generates a memory that leads to a, uh, a slower decay in the direction in which it is initially moving. And uh, I put here this D because, I mean, in, in three dimensions is three halves, in two dimensions is two halves. So it's the dimensionality divided by two, which is associated to the fraction of the momentum that is moving in this direction, which depends on the overall dimensionality of the system. So I think this is uh, an interesting uh, feature because it shows that the coupling, there is a mode coupling between the particle and the fluid and this type of um, models like like lattice Boltzmann, you can get it also with other ones you, you need the the dynamic the proper dynamic coupling between the particle and the solvent because it, both of them uh, evolve together in time and that leads to this memory uh, non markovian if you want behavior in, in the dynamics of these suspended particles um, Lattice Boltzmann is, is very powerful because it contains all this information naturally when, when you evolve the particles and the fluid. So you can compute these velocity of the correlation functions and, and you can extend them. For example, uh, you can now look at particle in an infinite medium, but now you can put one wall and you can also change boundary conditions. I was talking about stick boundary conditions. You can put also other type of boundary conditions like sleep or, and actually it, you always have a, an, an algebraic decay, but the exponent depends on the dimensionality, but also depends whether you have a wall or not and whether you have a stick boundary conditions or not. So there is a whole family of exponents that you can predict according to how the momentum is, is sort of uh, relaxed in the in the liquid and i mean the, these are lattice Boltzmann simulations that actually compare the I mean, this is in logarithmic to, to show the algebraic but these are algebraic tails and this is a comparison with the theory and actually there is no fitting parameter so one can really uh, get the exact result uh, numerically and it's uh, because everything is in, in there, it can even lead to surprising results. So I, I finished this part with uh, showing you an example that uh, was a bit surprising some time ago when, when we looked into it, which is uh, here I've been talking about having one wall or having no walls. And, and in both cases, uh, if, if there are no walls, then you have these vortices. If you put a wall naively, you could say, well, this momentum uh, diffusion uh, it's kind of uh, hindered by, by the presence of a wall, uh, and then it's only a fraction of the overall vorticity that can contribute. Actually, the, the decay is faster if you have a wall. So you could think that, uh, that if you put like two walls, then vorticity cannot develop because at some point it just interacts with the wall. The wall is like an infinite mass object, so it sucks momentum. And in that case, you would expect then to recover 
an exponential decay. But actually, there is more to it than that, because as I said, uh, the liquid, a liquid is always a bit compressible. There is always part of the of the momentum that is transferred through through sound. Normally, sound moves very far, fast, far away. And it's not relevant. But when when we look at the velocity autocorrelation function between two walls, what we saw is that instead of decaying exponentially, it changed sign. So which means that if the particle is moving to the right after a wall, uh, after a while starts moving to the left. And if one looks in detail into this decay, and this is the inset, this is also an algebraic decay with a different exponent. And actually, this is an interesting long time tail because it, it's uh, of different nature than the previous one. The previous one is associated to vorticity diffusion. This is actually associated to the fact that as a vorticity decays exponentially, but now the density wave that expands from the particle because you have the walls is partially reflected and then as a result, this kind of uh, cumulative reflection leads to a counterflow that is due to the compressibility of the fluid. And actually, uh, so, so in, the, in this case, is this compressibility that normally is not relevant that can lead to this, to this behavior. And this was something unexpected and uh, came out precisely because Lattice Boltzmann uh, incorporates a, this compressible part of the fluid. There, there are number of algorithms, algorithms in, in uh, classical uh, computational fluid dynamics that presume that the fluid is incompressible and then uh, remove any, any compressibility. Here, actually, the lattice Boltzmann is weakly compressible. On long times, this compressibility in many cases disappears, but it, it's there. So if the physics of the system is such that compressibility can lead to a transient coupling, then you're sure you capture it properly. And I think that's also interesting because, as I said, it's true that, I mean, when you read uh, books or I, I'm sure when if you, if you are exposed to lectures about uh, swimmers later on at, at these small scales, because Reynolds number is small, uh, one always assumes that the flow uh, is in the limit that is called creeping flow, so that then all these transient effects are irrelevant and one can really work only with momentum diffusion. Uh, and this is true in many cases, but one always has to be careful because in ensuring that this is the right regime, because strictly speaking, any fluid, because any propagation, uh, any perturbate, sorry, perturbation propagates at finite speed, there is always a fraction of time, normally short times, high frequencies, where uh, compressibility is relevant and cannot be uh, disregarded. So, one, so the, this lattice Boltzmann naturally allows you to, to look at all this time dependence behavior at low Reynolds number naturally because of the way in which it is formulated. So I'll finish here this part of the talk.